Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. um, with the rain outside, I, I, did, I, did, I didn't expect more than two, three people here. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you're not disappointed. Uh, the subject is, of course, very serious, but I can't wake up every morning and cry about my past. So I may put some levity into it, even though I'm not making fun of it. So that just is a warning ahead. I have a medal, a medallion, a yellow star. When the Nazis invaded Holland, the Netherlands, they forced all Jews to wear these stars to ensure our separation from the rest of the community. As a small child or children, we wore these with pride, unaware of the hatred and discrimination that this star represents. This yellow badge shows the rest of the world rich children cannot attend regular public school, rich families were banned from theaters, public transportation. If we were caught, with, uh, at, uh, if we were caught outside beyond curfew hours, we faced death. But with them on, we lost our freedom. We only had these stars to remind us that we were not alone in our struggle to survive. Now, despite the humiliation and the intolerance that this star represents, I still treasure mine. It traveled with me to Bergen-Belsen concentration camp, but I was not one of the one and a half million Jewish children who perished. I survived, as did the star. This yellow star, the symbol of our Jewish tribe, survived and survived the horrors of the Holocaust and the defeat of the Nazi swastika. I've kept it with me as a symbol of strength and it continues to remind me of the importance of openness, accepting others who are different from us, and hope for a better future. I will have a PowerPoint presentation. It says over there that I am a professor of physics emeritus. What that means is that I don't get paid anymore. <laughs> that I'm retired. I've been at UC almost 40 years and continue to go in occasionally, but I don't get paid anymore. But for those who are familiar with the campus, the word emeritus gives me free parking. <laughs> so it's good for something. Um, if you Google or check the web for the number of people who perished during World War II, the numbers are mind-boggling. Between 50 and 70 million people perished if you include what happened in China and Japan. For Russia, former Soviet Union, lost about 14% of the population, 23 million. China, 20 million, and so on down the line. Out of those, 11 million perished in Nazi death camps, concentration camps in Europe, mostly in Eastern Europe, Poland, Germany. Out of those 11 million were undesirables, homosexuals, 
gypsies, and six million Jews. So what's special about the Holocaust? Lots of people died at the war. The difference is if you were a baby, a grandma, a person with the word Jewish attached to you, you were met, then sent to the death chambers, the gas chambers. That's a terrible difference of what the Nazis did. Um, if you, maybe another introductory work, word, if you read your history books, including the good book, it's always the chronicles of battles. This tribe fighting that tribe, or this country invades that country. It talks about, it talks about kings and generals. It really talks about how these wars affect average people like you and me. If our leaders, the generals, the kings would consider that, maybe we wouldn't have some of these terrible wars. Wishful thinking. So my plan is to tell you what happened to one such family, the Fenichel family, my family. These are my parents on their wedding day. I have no idea who these children are, I guess children of friends. 1935 in Holland, in the Netherlands. I, I should be careful in using the term Holland or the Netherlands. What is it? The name of the country is the Netherlands. Holland is one of the provinces, one of the states in the Netherlands. It happened to have in it Amsterdam, commercial capital, New York City equivalent, The Hague, the Washington equivalent, and, so, and Rotterdam. So everybody calls it Holland, but the real, the proper name is the Netherlands. But you can still call it Holland, it's okay. <laughs> After they got married, they moved in a typical Dutch brownstone uh, home on the second floor in The Hague, the capital. This is me a few years ago going back to see, once I started to be invited to talk about the past, uh, how much of that really happened. And you wouldn't believe the records that I found. These damn Nazis kept records unreal. So I will share some of those with you. Uh, those days, we didn't have these little toys to take selfies and pictures. We also didn't know from color, so there are not many pictures left. But we're able to find, find a few. And these are probably some of my first steps. And my mother is holding me. Uh, I found this picture of me playing with my friends. You, you can tell who I am, right? No? I'm the cute guy on the left here. <laughs> And this is the only family picture that I have. Meaning, because soon thereafter, all hell broke loose, and the Nazis, okay, why does this work? Ah. The Nazis invade Holland, the Netherlands, and life changed. Now, when the Nazis invaded, and maybe a word about Nazis versus Germans. Certainly not all Germans were Nazis. And for that matter, Hitler was elected democratically. Unfortunately, what happened is that there were too many Germans, bystanders, allowing the Nazis to do what they did. So don't be a bystander. When they invaded Holland, they didn't immediately round up the Jews. They were very smart about what they did. And the Dutch language and the German language are sort of familiar, and you know, the Dutch speak English and German and French and all of that. In the beginning, they did nothing. But all of a sudden, the cop on the street corner, instead of being a Dutch cop, is now a Nazi cop or a Dutch collaborator. And there were plenty of those. And it took a year 
the invasion was May 40, and May 41, the restrictions started. Initially, Jews are not allowed to possess wireless. This is a list of the restrictions that I found up in the records. What's wireless? That's the internet of those days. Shortwave radio, which allows you to listen to the Voice of America or the British Broadcasting Company. By the way, as an aside, the Voice of America came from this area. If you take 75 and go north to Westchester, you see a bunch of tall towers. That's where the Voice of America was broadcasting. Not anymore, but it's a little museum, which I don't even think they charge. Just like this place, you know, it's worthwhile going and seeing it. Anyway, and then a few weeks later, you cannot go into non-Jewish organizations. Kids cannot go to non-Jewish schools. Then at some point you have to have a new ID. And so on down the line, almost a year later, when they finally had to wear that special star. No ID. You don't know how lucky we are in this country <laughs> that we don't have a government-mandated government ID that we need to carry with us, a passport. Not true in the rest of the world. You fly to Paris, go into a hotel, they want to see a passport, they write that information, that goes to the local police. In this country, well, the driver's license is your ID, but it's nothing mandated by Washington or by the government. And hopefully the Patriot Act and some of the other nonsense that goes on in Washington will not bring us to that stage. One day they announced you need to renew your ID, your passport. You know, they didn't know from plastic then, it was a piece of paper. And if you happen to be Jewish, they put a J on it. All right, we're not embarrassed or ashamed that we are Jews, just like in this country, you know. We have Jews, we're Christian, Muslims, what have you. But that's how slowly but surely it starts. Soon thereafter, we have to wear the yellow star. By the way, this is how you spell Jew in Dutch. The J is like the Y, Yod. But then soon thereafter, they start rounding up Jewish men supposedly to go to labor camps. Even that could almost be acceptable, right? There's a war going on and the enemy needs tents and guns and stuff. So you take the manpower of the country you captured and you put them in as slaves in factories. That's the point at which my father was taken away, of course, never to return. He was killed in Auschwitz. Soon thereafter, they start rounding up not just men, but women, children, babies, grandparents. You need those in labor camps. If you haven't found a place to hide by then, this is the time to go and hide. And I assume many of you are familiar with the story of Anne Frank, the diary of Anne Frank. Anne Frank and her family hid in a loft above a store that they have in Amsterdam, New York City equivalent. My mother and I went into hiding into this building in, in The Hague. It was an infirmary and a child care center. If strange guys were walking around suspicious, my mother would be upstairs on a cot feigning contagious disease and I would be playing with the kids here or across the street where there was a park. Um, again, let me remind you that Anne Frank was a teenager at the time and she kept a diary. I was between the ages of four and six when the story that I'm telling you had happened. Uh, the diary has yet to be written. But the records are there. When we went back a few years ago to look at the story, among the records that I found is this document. This says Fennischel Heinrich, I was born Heinrich, and they crossed out the address, the brown stone that I showed you the picture of, for a while we were in, in a holding place in Amsterdam, 15 May 1943, in Europe they do the day first and the month, we were taken to a camp called Westerborg, a transit camp 
on the border of the Netherlands and Germany, BB, 1st February 1944, we were taken to Bergen-Belsen. The records they kept was unreal. I have a card like this from my mother and a card from my father the day I arrived in Auschwitz, the day they killed him. This is for those who deny the Holocaust happened. You know, people deny it happened. I assume that they haven't read their books or traveled and discovered that it didn't happen. They're probably anti-Semites. They should know that every time they deny the Holocaust, their heroes, the Nazis, are turning in their graves. They were proud of what they were doing. They kept records. And in the last few years, more and more of this has been coming out. Uh, for a while, oh, uh, for a while we stayed when we were captured in Amsterdam in a theater, and I remember for a few days or a week or how long sleeping on benches. Just imagine this is a theater in the front before we were taken on to the next camp. After the war, they decided to tear the theater down. This is in Amsterdam, but they left the front facade, and it. It's become a uh, museum, and there's a list of all the people who were in that temporary housing during the war. And I'm pointing out that my name, Fanichel, and Frank F. is a little further up there somewhere. But from there, we ended up going to Westerborg. By the way, this is, this is a picture that I found in a history book, and it shows what happens when you were ca called to go to the camp. You were told in 15 minutes you need to be down on the sidewalk, loaded up on little trucks, and taken to the camp. This picture, the, the profile of this woman over here, splitting image of my mother. If that's my mother, this could very well be me. But whether it is or isn't doesn't matter. It shows you what had to be done. We didn't have those days these fancy backpacks that we all carry nowadays. My mother took a pillowcase. I loaded it up with my toys to go to camp. It was not summer camp. In fact, the camp was not that bad. It was more like a ghetto than a camp, meaning there was a fence around. You couldn't go in and out. And the whole internal operation was actually won by a Jewish committee, and, uh, but well, you couldn't go out, and there was a commandant, German Nazis who kept an eye on it, but otherwise life was reasonably normal. I was with my mother in a women's barrack, triple-decker, but it was nice and clean. It wasn't that terrible. Some of the pictures that were taken around that time, you could see, Sort of okay. The only problem was that the committee who ran the camp every Tuesday morning had to line up on the order of a thousand people, between 900 and 1200. Number was important. Didn't matter, men, women, children, babies, loaded up on train station, on cattle cars, going east most of whom never came back. So clearly what you try to do is try and not be on this Tuesday morning train ride from Westerborg to the east. So let me take a little break now and tell you the miracle by which I survived. While all of this is going on in Europe, and in fact starting out in the 1860s, there lived in Palestine, in the Holy Land, a group of Christians from southern Germany who called themselves Templars. Not after Knight Templars, but they believed that each one of us has the temple in ourselves and that there was a society of temples. And they felt it was very important for Christians to reside in the Holy Land to speed up the return of the Messiah. So they would go there, spend a few years, come back over time. They actually built a few villages over there. 
If you go to Jerusalem today, one of the suburban areas called the German colony, and it's still useful over there. Imagine these are German citizens, which are very proper Germans. You know, they, they, they put German villagers in this bedlam called the Holy Land, camels and donkeys running around, and they planted trees equidistant from each other. The houses have all nice red look, and they dressed very properly. This is a picture of them opening a school, suit and tie, in this hot desert. Anyway, uh, the uh, village, this is a village outside Jaffa, nowadays in Tel Aviv. The, ci the city fathers decided to, <coughs> to keep it, so, but the city the, is now <laughs> growing all the way around it. But if you go to Israel, to Tel Aviv, this is now a place to relax, a little museum, a coffee shop, and so on down the line. This might be an appropriate time to say something about the Middle East. We hear it in the news every day. Before 19, World War I, 1910, 15, there were no countries in the Middle East. The whole thing was run by the Turks. Turkey was part of the Ottoman Empire. World War I, the British and the French take over and create countries. So the mess we have in the Middle East today, it's, it's damn British, didn't know how to draw borders. <laughs> I mean, th th think of it, Iraq. Shia people live over here, Sunni over here, the Kurds up there. Uh, why div divided that way in Lebanon and Syria and so forth? And this was Jordan. These countries didn't exist then. But anyway, they, they exist today. And I found this a, a map of what the Middle East would look like if the countries were divided according to ethnic backgrounds. What surprised me, okay, so Iraq is what I just mentioned to you. This is Saudi Arabia. I thought it was just a big desert, but they also have different ethnic groups in there. Anyway, let's continue. So, so here you have coming World War II. Palestine is run by the British. It has German citizens living in there. Many of the men left Palestine, went back to Germany to fight for the cause. Why? To me, it makes no sense. But then you have Jewish friends, Arab friends, Muslim friends. By the way, you should distinguish between Arab and Muslim. Arab is a language. Muslim is a religion. Most of the Arabs in Palestine and Israel are Christians, not Muslims. In Bethlehem, you have Christians. In Nazareth, you have Christians. That's a different lecture. Anyway, so you have men, German men, go back, leave their families, and go back to fight with the Nazis. The men that didn't go are in British control Palestine, enemy men. The British rounded up and shipped them off to. Australia, where they're still today. There's a Templar colony in Melbourne, Australia. So here you have a few hundred women and children, Germans, li living in British-controlled Palestine. They want to go back to Germany. Somebody uh, in the Dutch Jewish leadership says, uh -uh. you have Germans in Palestine, want to go back to Germany? Let's find people from Palestine and Germany who want to come back to Palestine. Clearly, there were none of those. So on a pretext of a connection to Palestine, the German, the Nazis, agreed to create a list of people which have a connection to Palestine. And it turns out that my father had a brother and sister and family living in Palestine at the time. So my mother got ourselves on that list sometime. And one day, while we were still in Westerborg, the camp on the border of Germany, we get a certificate that says that we have a good chance of being on an exchange list. My mother takes this up to the front desk to the commandant and says, we have been placed on a list to go to Palestine. He looks at it and he says, uh-uh. What do you mean, uh-uh? 
This is official. I mean, it came from Geneva, the Red Cross. It has a stamp in it, signature. Uh uh. It doesn't have any numbers on it. These damn Nazis, you know, people have numbers on their arms. So, a few months later, we got a new one with all kinds of verbiage and numbers. The commandant was impressed. But not much happened, and comes February 1st, 1944, we were loaded up on a train and end up in Bergen-Belsen. I found a list of all the Tuesday, Tuesday morning trains going to the east. Starting in the 11th, January 44, this many people went to Bergen-Belsen. The following week, to Regenstadt. After that, Auschwitz, and so on down the line. The arrow points at the one that my mother and I were on, and Frank was on the ones on the bottom over here. Uh, initially, originally, Bergen-Belsen was not meant to be a concentration camp. It was going to be a detention camp where the Germans, Nazis, would kept, put in Allied captured soldiers and trade them for German soldiers, Nazi soldiers that the Allies captured. It was going to be like an exchange here. But as the war went on, they more and more people were sent in there and it became the mess that it was no summer camp. I'm sure you have seen enough of these pictures that I don't have to say much about them. Uh, maybe except to say that now we are in holy Ger Germany and God forbid we would have a star that says Jew in Dutch. We have to take this one off and put on one that is in German. That's why I have this one. Uh, how do you make these things? Take a big sheet, stamp it, and then cut it. My mother, being a good Dutch woman, made sure that I kept mine clean, didn't get it dirty. Uh, I mentioned that Amsterdam, I mean, Bergen-Belsen was not a death camp. But when the camp was freed by the Allies in the April 1945, they found that pile of shoes of people who didn't make it. This was, it was not gas chambers, it was disease, illness, malnutrition, and shoes are in that pile also. Uh, what do I remember from the camp? I remember the meals. We had to stand outside the barrack and we had these little metal dishes and there was this big barrel, like a garbage pail, full of some slop they called soup and somebody would ladle it into our little containers and we had some black bread and that was our meal for the day. <clears throat> After the meal, they had us, the few children that were there, clean those barrels. In retrospect, that was not a punishment. They figured maybe while we're doing it, we can find a few extra potato peels for nourishment. Anyway, we were there for about a half a year and then eventually ended up on the, uh, on the, on the train, a proper train for the exchange to, on the summer of 1944, June 30th, 1944, 222 Dutch Jews, mostly older people, not many children, or boys from 14 to 45, my mother and I included among them, and we were loaded up on a train. I'm six years old at that point. I remember that train ride much better. Uh, it, this is just a picture of a typical train in, in Europe. You know, you have a cabin, you have a bench on one side, maybe a bench on the other side. At night, if it's an overnight train, you can slide them together and you can sleep in, in them. Uh, if you, uh, you know, if you have three people sitting here and three here, and at night it's pretty crowded. 
Luggage we didn't have, so every night they tied me up on the luggage rack. That's what a six-year-old remembers from the train ride. I remember once we were on a side railing, and there was a peasant outside, and she, she had a basket full of cherries, humongous cherries, as big as apples. I don't know whether she was trying to sell it to us or give it to us, and obviously cherries are not as big as apples. But here's a kid, for two years I haven't seen fresh fruit, and that's the memory that I have of, of that scene. Anyway, we continued on. <clears throat> the actual exchange, to, this is just a st standard picture, took place on the Bos Bosphorus in Turkey, one ferry taking 220 <laughs> Dutch Jews east, and the other the Templars west to Germany. I think we got a better deal there. Uh, this is the uh, map of the route. Okay, uh, the Netherlands, Holland is right down here where I'm pointing. You can fit it between here and Columbus, give you a sense of how big the country is. And the train route, Bergen-Belsen is over there. This is Germany, France, and so on. And went all the way down, Vienna, the Orient Express, the actual exchange took place in Turkey over here, then we continued through Syria, Lebanon, into Israel. What I think is interesting about that train route, you hear all the problems that are going on in Syria right now, people escaping from Syria are taking that same route in the opposite direction. What is it about us as human beings that we do this to each other? Terrible. Okay, so we continue and we arrive in the Holy Land and I'm furious with my mother. She promised me we'll never be in another camp again and what did the British do? They put us in the camp. But obviously it was not a Nazi camp it, and you can see it was relatively clean. It was just to check us, to give us injections, to connect us with the family and make the transition uh, oh, um, but I never forgive her. It, it turns out that the camp is still in existence today as a museum, and when we were there a few years ago, uh, I was there. And <laughs> when, when they discovered that I was there as a child, as part of the exchange, they made me sit down and interviewed me, placed just like this. <laughs> and uh, okay, so now we are in Palestine. And of course, we need to have a new passport, a new ID. So let me read this to you. Remember, Palestine is run by the British. So it's the government of Palestine, English, Arabic, and Hebrew from right to left, Department of Migration, Arabic, Hebrew, right to left. This is to certify that Fenichel, Fessel Paula, and San Hangrish are now residents of Palestine. So you see, I'm actually a Palestinian. That's a different lecture. And we, we didn't look that bad. My mother apparently was not in good shape, they decided. So the social workers and their wisdom decided to separate us. I found some, by the way, we have great records in Cincinnati. There's a Hebrew Union College across the street from UC and they have an incredible library. And I found newspapers from that time indicating the train arrived, how many people on the uh, listed. I found a list of passengers. This is the second page, and I'm actually the first one on top of that list. And, uh, but what the social work workers and their wisdom, apropos what's happening on a Mexican border, decided to separate my mother and me. It was not a punishment but they felt she would be better with the family where she would regain set, and I was sent to a children's home. It was not a prison, but, uh, and it was the philosophy those days. You know, some of the early settlers that came to the Holy Land, 1900 or what have you, uh, lived in collective settlements. And in these settlements, kibbutzim, the children always lived in a separate unit. So, so that's the philosophy, I think. Nowadays we say what idiocy, but anyway, so I'm one of the guys on the bottom. The village is called Naharia. It was on the northern part of Israel on the seashore, summer 1944. 
six years old. I was there for, for four years. I remember some ships coming in. Uh, I found a few other things. Let me just speed up so we can bring this to a end soon. Whoop. This remote I'm not familiar with and it doesn't seem to work that well. Oh, this is uh, my, my hero. This is a picture of me with the first Israeli president, a scientist by the name of Haim Weizmann. Haim Weizmann was a scientist who worked in England and he helped them during World War I to, f to figure out how to get acetone or some other stuff that was important to military purposes in World War I. And through that, he was able to get the British government to encourage or help Jews come to the Holy Land. And, and he was in that neighborhood at some point, and uh, that's me as a, I guess, an eight-year-old. Okay, life goes on. Ten years old, 1948, another war. Israel's War of Independence. Uh, when Jews first came to the Holy Land, starting out 1900, they, they thought there'll be one country, Christians, Jews, Muslims will live together, and there'll be one country somehow. It didn't work out. So the United Nations, back in 1947, said, you know what, why don't we divide the country into two parts? A Jewish part, which ended up being Israel, the blue stuff over here, and a Palestinian part, the green and the pink, would belong to the Palestinians. For all I know, the Palestinians accepted it, but the neighbors didn't. Immediately when that was declared, Syria, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, Iran, Egypt, invaded the country, drive the Jews to the sea. Well, it didn't work for them. Not only didn't they drive the Jews to the sea, they lost all that pink stuff. And they got left with the West Bank, West Bank of Jordan. This is the Jordan River, Sea of Galilee, the Dead Sea, and the river between them. And the country of Jordan is on, on this side, and Egypt is down there. For the next 20 years, the West Bank, Palestine, was run by the Jordanians. They didn't give them independence. Gaza was run by the Egyptians. They didn't give him independence. Then 20 years later, 56, there was another war. The Israelis took over, and they haven't given them independence either. So there's a problem. But you need to know that history when you say, we need a Palestine right now. And what I mean by that is there really was never a Palestine country. And for all I know, even if Israel would accept having a Palestinian country, the other Arab countries wouldn't. Think of it, all the Arab countries, Syria, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, are all run by autocrats, generals, kings. If Palestine becomes an independent country, it'll probably run like a democracy, similar to what Israel is. Those countries I don't think want to have in their midst a Palestinian state, but that's another different issue. Okay, anyway, there's another war. The village I stayed in, my mother would come and visit me frequently, and I, all vacations and holidays I would be with her. After the war, she came and picked me up, and she told me that she got married. So I moved to Tel Aviv with my, a new stepfather, lived in a typical brown structure. What is interesting about this structure, vis-a-vis -vis Cincinnati, it's sort of like the over the Rhine region. That's the place to be in nowadays. <laughs> and, uh, but life was rough, you know, you, you, food was on a ration. At that point, I'm 14 years old. And uh, my stepfather had two brothers in the United States, and they said, 
you know, why don't you come over here? You know, over here the sidewalks are paved with gold. Hey, sidewalks paved with gold, how do you resist that? So we hop on a boat by the name of Andrea Doria. Some of you may have heard the name. This was her maiden voyage. She represented the rebirth of the Italian merchant marine. And uh, as you know, two years later, she sank just like the Titanic. My wife, who is in the audience, tells me that a cat has nine lives, so I still have a few more to go. <laughs> we come into the New York Harbor, Statue of Liberty on the left, skyscrapers on the right, and on a small black and white TV, Eisenhower gives his inaugural speech, January 1953. That was my great welcome into this wonderful country. And you know what? I found out that the sidewalks are paved with gold. But you have to break your back when you bend down to pick it up. But the opportunities in this country are incredible. Look, I'm a kid with nothing. I turned out to become a physics professor. Anyway, so uh, let me just try and bring it to some conclusion. Uh, so we lived in Brooklyn. Brooklyn is one of the suburbs of New York City. Brooklyn, that's a Dutch name. And I went to the local high school. New Utrecht, Utrecht, that's a city in the, in, uh, so there's a lot of Dutch flavor in New York City area. Then I went across town into Brooklyn College, all free. Well, maybe not completely free. We had to pay $10 registration free for each semester. While I was a sophomore, I think either sophomore or junior, they raised the fee from $10 to $25. There was a riot on campus. <laughs> but you had to have the grades to get in there. I think, I don't remember, my wife probably remembers, 90 some odd points in high school. <laughs> so, but hey, I wouldn't be here if it was not for the free opportunity. Then we went across the river. I got myself a PhD in physics at Watkins University. Started to look for a place to work. Her family, my family, my wife, by then I was married. I met my wife at Brooklyn College. Um, and uh, we drew a circle one day's drive and I got an invitation from UC. 19, January 1965. Figure we'll come here for a few years and then move on. Never thought I'll retire in here. Discovered this is an incredible community. Great cultural activity, wonderful people. And so we stayed here. We have two daughters. My one complaint about the city is that uh, the Ohio River ain't the ocean. You know, we, we need a sandy beach to, beach to see sun, walks barefoot and, and sunsets. But you can't have everything. So I went to UC, became a physics professor. Professors teach classes, but they also conduct research. And I was supervising graduate student for almost 40 years until came to retire. And the happy ending is that we had a happy family in here. And this is my family, taken a few years ago. Two daughters, Joan and Debbie. Joan married a high school sweetheart, Rick. Debbie married a Canadian boy. Debbie went to the University of Toronto to get a graduate degree in museum studies. The people who run this place will tell you there's no, not many places specialize in creating museums. And, but they have a specialty over there. Her husband, a Canadian boy from Toronto, went to UC Medical School. <laughs> so somebody introduced them. But instead of her keeping him in Cincinnati, he dragged her up to his extended family in Toronto. Which is OK, I guess. Uh, my concern about her marrying a doctor was that, you know, it's, they have a tough life, it's very difficult, you know, uh, you don't know what kind of schedule he has to keep. But then I discovered that he was an undergraduate physics major. 
So it couldn't be that bad, right? <laughs> so I let them get married. <laughs> they have two kids, Eliana, now 10 years old, and Jacob, 13. And uh, Rick and Joan have two daughters who are now in college. Uh, let me just bring this to, when I give this presentation in uh, high schools typically, I conclude with this message. So what did we learn? This is a poem that is attributed to a Martin Niemöller. He was a an German anti-Nazi theologian, a Lutheran pastor, who is known for this poem or something equivalent. I'll read it to you. In Germany, they came first for the communists, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist. And then they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a trade unionist. And then there are more and more lines. And then they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. And then and then they came for me, and by that time there was nobody left to speak up. Tell the kids, don't be a bystander. On your level, bullying or something, try and stop it in class. Later on in life, choose the right politicians. And maybe my final word, <laughs> word I, I guess, until I say another one, <laughs> is that uh, the next time you hear the word, six million Jews perished in Nazi gas chambers, concentration camp, out of which one and a half million were children. Forget the numbers. One child, a future household member, housewife died. Another child, a future architect died. Another child, a future carpenter, and so on down the line one and a half million times. Thank you.